is Rose Woman. My English, I guess, name, my forced colonial name is Jessa Calderon. Um, I am Tova as well as Chumash, and I have been invited here to represent the California people. With that being said, I would like to acknowledge the people of this land who we are standing on, the Ohlone Nation. Um, I don't see any here, and I think that is a very big deal. There should be an Ohlone representative here as well, because I am a visitor here, although I am California native. I come from the San Fernando Valley, Los Angeles, and Ventura area. So I hope to represent the Ohlone people to the best of my ability as I speak, because they are also coastal people like myself. Um, I have been here to speak against the, uh, or, uh, the opposing of the oil drilling, so that's why I am here. Thank you. Buenas tardes, mi nombre es Luis Monterio, soy del pueblo quichua de Sabayaco, centro sur de la Amazonia ecuatoriana. Estamos aquí para dar criterios, experiencias como pueblos originarios, dar criterios de soluciones a los problemas del cambio climático. Y eso hemos venido a, a compartir con ustedes. So my name is Yaku Viteri. I come from the Quechua people of Sariaku in South Central Ecuadorian Amazon. And I am here to represent my people in presenting uh, criteria and solutions to the problems of climate change that we're facing. Buenas tardes, mi nombre es Nemo Tenenquimo, soy nacionalidad Guaurani. Aquí he llegado originariamente a, a explicar sobre cambio climático y esperemos más luego como detallar. Good afternoon, uh, my name is Noemi Ticana. Uh, I come from the Guarani people of the Ecuadorian Amazon. And, and I'm here this afternoon to speak about my people's uh, struggle against climate change. We've been joined by Isabel Azizi, who is an organizer with Stand.Earth and I don't know more SF Bay. As I said at the beginning, she was at a meeting with the Bay Area, Bay Area Air Quality Management District, and so she's late because she's actively today working to protect our land from tar sands. So, thank you, Izzy. Hello, everyone. Thank you again. My name is Isabella Zizi. I come from the Northern Cheyenne, Arikara, and Muskogee Creek tribes. And I've been, I was born and raised in Richmond, California, in occupied Ohlone territory, which is under the shadows of the Chevron oil refinery that had exploded August 6, 2012, that sent over 15,000 residents to the hospital. And I've been very active ever since then, making sure that no other communities will have to deal with that. Oh, thank you. So as Isabella began to touch on, a lot of the people who are here have been impacted by oil drilling and by fossil fuel infrastructure. So I'd like to open the panel by asking each of you to share a bit about how oil drilling or the threat of oil drilling and oil infrastructure more generally has impacted you and your community. So being Tongva and Chumash coastal people, um, in the, in the Tongva tribe, we call our plank canoe the Tia. And in the Chumash tribe, we call our plank canoe uh, the Tomo. And so, you know, there was the oil spill in Santa Barbara in the 1960s and again in 2010. And so every time an incident like this occurs, we are forced to stay out of our waters. We uh, don't have access to our waters. And, that's a very heavy thing because that is, um, when we go out and we paddle 
we are basically doing a ceremony. You know, my elders tell me that with every paddle, with every pool is a prayer. And so we are not able to practice our traditions in that way because we're overlooking what's going on and, and helping to clean up. And we're a part of this where, you know, we're not able to be out there. We're not able to do our fishing. And so to us, that's a big deal. And it's, it hasn't just been restricted to the ocean. It's also been on our lands, you know, being Tongva, um, they are right now threatening our wetlands area. And uh, they keep taking more and more every chance they get. And so this is a big thing that it's, it's not only affecting me, you know, as, as an animal, it's affecting our ocean animal as well, you know, and, and we're watching them plop up dead. And so as long as we keep losing this, you know, we have to understand that there will be a time that we will be lost as well, further than mentally, but I mean in non-existent. So that is why we continue to speak up. We continue to do our work in the community to be as preventative as possible. But in that case, we need to dig deeper and go back to the old ways as much as people say that's impossible. We lived thousands of years without this lifestyle. And I think we can live a lot longer, another couple thousand years, whereas in the last 500 years, you know, and, and 200 years alone, America alone, has done so much destruction in 2,000 years. What we were keeping solid and healthy in thousands of years, they've destroyed it in 200. And with the Spaniards in 500 total. So if we stop living the colonialism way of thinking, we can definitely be better at preservation. So currently in the Bay Area, alone in the Bay Area, we have five oil refineries on the East Bay of San Francisco. There's Chevron, Shell, Tesoro, Phillips 66, and Valero. And one of them had changed their name recently. I can't think of it right now because I was in mode on coming here. <laughs> um, and like I mentioned, the Chevron refinery had a had its explosion, it caused thousands of people to go to the hospital. And in most recent news, there's the Phillips 66 project that is in Rodeo, California, near Crockett. And the meeting that I was that I had just left early, the Bay Area Air Quality Management District meeting, uh, members, board, and staff, they're the ones who who regulate um, any issues that goes along with our air and also with our water, our air qualities in our water. And they recently passed a few permits, two permits this year, about the Phillips 66 project. And this was all done in secret, behind bars, not letting the community know about this. And at the same time, while this is occurring, a lot of people don't know, but this is a direct connection. This refinery expansion is a direct connection to what is happening up in Canada with the Kinder Morgan Trans Mountain Pipeline. If they pursue with that pipeline, shout out to Cedar George Parker out there who's been resisting that. Um, if, they, if they try to pursue in continuing this project, which we won't let them, they, were, they will want to extract more tar sands, also known as oil sands or bitumen, um, from the original people of those, of those lands without consent and that will eventually make its way by ship here in the San Francisco Bay. And currently there are 59 ships that go, of really cargo ships that carry thousands of barrels of tar sands oil and other crude oil. And they're wanting to double that to over 130 ships. And by the amounts of ships, you know, we also have to count the amounts of barrels of oil. So they're wanting to, bring in 51,000 barrels. They're wanting to jump from 51,000 barrels to over 130,000 barrels a year through our San Francisco Bay. It's not, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when oil spills into the ocean. There is no solution to clean that up, which like my sister here had said, it's not only our lives that are being put at risk, but it's also our relatives in, in the sea those who fly above us, those who crawl below us, and those who swim around us. 
And we need to continue to raise our awareness about that and make sure that that does not happen. Because it's not just the folks in Rodeo or Crockett that is being impacted, it's all of us here in California, all of our relatives up in Canada, and it's also a direct connection to our relatives down in the global south. All of these issues connect, and we are here to make sure that that does not happen. Because what we had also told the Bay Area Air Quality Management District members, board and staff, is that if you approve this permit, we will make this a standing rock in our own backyard. Because it's come to that point where we have to put our bodies on the line to disrupt business as usual, and we will make sure we will cost them millions and billions of dollars to stop any more projects. Bueno, considero importante memorizar para quienes han olvidado y para quienes desconocen. Decir que desde la conquista el territorio amazónico ha, sido, ha tenido una amenaza constante. La era petrolera, la era minera, en la actualidad es un hecho. Pero si hablamos de las invasiones territoriales, de los despojos territoriales que ha sufrido la Amazonía, podemos hablar de la era del caucho, la era del algodón, la era del petróleo, hace 40 años, 60 años en nuestro país. Llegó la era del agua, la era de las minas. Quiero decir con esto que nuestros territorios han sufrido y siguen sufriendo. ¿Por qué? Porque desde la era industrial de los países desarrollados, las corporaciones industriales a nombre de un desarrollo han incursionado en nuestros territorios, violentando derechos humanos, violentando derechos ambientales. Y el mundo, una parte del mundo, una parte de la sociedad desconoce estas realidades que vivimos los pueblos. De hecho, uno de los que ha sufrido estos atropellos es un pueblo sabayano. Ustedes han de conocer el caso Sarayaco en el año 2004, donde una compañía de manera inconsulta ingresó a nuestro territorio. Since the, the conquest of the Americas, the Amazon has faced a series of threats, from mining to oil, uh, with, and, and beyond, we have uh, suffered from invasion and theft of our lands. Um, in years past, it was rubber, and then it was cotton, and, and most recently it's been oil, um, but also our water um, and, our, and, and mines have been built, uh, and our territory has suffered, and we have suffered. And, and why is this happening? Because uh, the so-called developed countries um, and uh, industrial corporations, uh, in, in the name of so-called development, uh, have wanted to take over these resources. They violated our human rights. They violated the rights of nature. Um, and there's a, a big part of this world that, 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 won't, that won't hear this, that won't learn this history, that doesn't want to learn this history. Um, and my people, the people of Sariaku, uh, is an example of, of this violent history. This year, and de que la forma organizativa de nuestro pueblo tuvo que enfrentar ese atropello. Las leyes de nuestro país ignoraron el problema que tuvimos con una compañía petrolera, hasta que tuvimos que llegar al Acuerdo Interamericano de Derechos Humanos, y la cual dio un fallo a favor de nuestro pueblo, y el Estado ecuatoriano tuvo que rendir cuentas. Con esto quiere decir de que el territorio amazónico 
es solamente visto como, como un recurso, como un simple material donde desconocen a los pueblos, las culturas y otros seres que habitamos en ese territorio. ¿Y por qué estamos aquí? Para poder hacer entender esa visión de vida que los pueblos tenemos, a esa visión de vida que tenemos y que desconocen estas corporaciones, estos poderes económicos en el mundo. Porque tienen sola, solamente piensan en una ambición opulenta de explotar los recursos, no les interesa la vida de otros pueblos, no les interesa si el agua tiene seres o no, si los bosques y si los árboles son seres vivos o no. Lo que están viendo está en función del capital económico. El capital sobre el ser humano, el capital sobre la naturaleza, el capital sobre los derechos ambientales y eso ha generado un conflicto mundial y ha generado un problema ambiental a lo que ahora lo llamamos como el cambio climático. So we have uh, we have confronted the uh, the fact that the Ecuadorian government has completely run roughshod over its own laws. Um, we dealt with this when a an oil company tried to come into our territory and extract oil from our lands, and we fought back. We took the case all the way to the Inter-American Court on Human Rights, and the court ruled in our favor, and it ordered the Ecuadorian government to uh, to right its wrongs, um, and we have been defending our territory ever since. And and the reason this happens is because companies and so many countries uh, see the Amazon, see forests as just a resource to be exploited, uh, a material to to buy and sell, and it, ignoring the, the the cultures that are there, the peoples that are there, the beings that that live in the forest. So that's why we're here. That's why we're here in California, because we want to help the world understand this vision, uh, understand the way we see the world, that uh, that is full of life, that that we are full of life, and that the forest is full of life. And this is a vision that, that companies and, and many governments want to, to ignore, because they only think about exploiting these so-called resources. They're not interested in, in, in life. They're not interesting, interested in knowing if there are living beings in the water, if there are living beings in the forest. They only think in, in economic terms, um, and they, they put capital, they put money over human rights, over the rights of nature, over indigenous peoples. And that's why we are at this point of so much conflict in the world, and why we are at this point of, of environmental catastrophe, uh, and, or what we're calling now climate change. Muchos estados nacionales o gobiernos nacionales en nuestros países hablan de protección ambiental, tienen proyectos de proteger el medio ambiente, al igual que aquí en California, hablan de, de salvar al medio ambiente, pero sin embargo siguen explotando el petróleo. Hace unos días fuimos a verificar la refinería de la Chevron, donde la gente está amenazada alrededor. ¿De dónde viene ese petróleo del Ecuador? Entonces, hay mucha incoherencia en estos gobernantes, hay mucha incoherencia en estas corporaciones transnacionales que por una parte hablan de salvar al medio ambiente, de cuidar al medio ambiente, pero sin cuenta de ello. ¿Y dónde está la responsabilidad de ellos? Y nosotros como pueblos estamos asumiendo esa responsabilidad y por eso estamos planteando alternativas, soluciones al cambio climático. Y por eso está el pueblo sabiendo que presente. Tenemos una propuesta seria, una propuesta verdadera de conservar nuestro territorio con una visión filosófica de vida propia. So many, many governments talk about protecting the environment and they have lots of programs to do so. Um, they, want to sa they say they want to save the earth, but at the same time they're pursuing oil extraction and supporting the oil industry. Just a few days ago, we went to see the, the Chevron refinery in Richmond, and we saw how it was also threatening the people who live alongside of it. And much of that oil that's refined there is actually coming from Ecuador. And so we continue to see this, this incoherence, this, 
this cognitive dissonance between, on the one hand, talking about uh, saving the environment, yet, on, on the other hand, destroying it and contaminating it. And, but we as indigenous peoples, uh, we have a response, we have alternatives and we have solutions. Um, and so that's why we're here, that's why Sadiaku is here, to, to tell the world about the proposals that we have that are based in, in, um, in reality and in coherent uh, connection with the ways that we see the world and the ways that we relate directly to the environment and in support of all life. Esa propuesta se llama Causa Sacha o Centro de Viviente. De ahí la determinamos tres aspectos fundamentales. Conservar nuestro territorio, dejar el petróleo bajo tierra y que el Estado ecuatoriano y las instituciones nacionales e internacionales quienes dicen cuidar el medio ambiente legitimen a esta propuesta como Causa Sacha como un ser vivo y un sujeto de derecho. Eso es el aporte contundente para el cambio climático. Y con esta propuesta también estamos haciendo incidencia en nuestra localidad, incidencia nacional e internacional con quien criterio. Estamos haciendo conciencia ambiental desde nuestra perspectiva. No es una receta de un Estado, es una visión de un pueblo. Y creo que por eso estamos aquí, para compartir propuestas de iniciativa de los pueblos que estamos preocupados por este problema ambiental climático. This proposal that we have is called Kausak Sacha, uh, or Living Forest, and it's, it's based on, on three principles. The first is the conservation of the rainforest. The second is keeping oil in the ground. And the third is that both the Ecuadorian government and these international institutions and entities that say they want to protect the environment and fight climate change, that they actually recognize and support this initiative and, and these kinds of initiatives from indigenous peoples. Um, and, and recognize the forest, the living forest, as a bearer of rights. This is, these are the kinds of concrete, realistic, important proposals that the world needs to hear. And so that's why we're here doing advocacy and doing advocacy around the world and trying to, to create consciousness um, and raise consciousness about the the real kinds of solutions that will protect the environment and the kinds of solutions that indigenous peoples have to do that. And we also understand that as indigenous peoples, we have to be uh, sharing with each other our visions and our solutions so that we can build upon them together. Para culminar, invitarles a conocer las visiones de los pueblos los sueños de los pueblos originarios, la sabiduría de los pueblos originarios, la espiritualidad de los pueblos originarios, acercarse mucho más a nuestra realidad para, poder, para que puedan entender lo que estamos planeando como pueblos originarios. Unir fuerzas, unir estrategias, hacer alianzas con la sociedad, con la gente comprometida, con la academia, con la gente que realmente quiere salvar al mundo. Por eso estamos aquí y eso sería mi invitación hacia ustedes y a la sociedad norteamericana que también existe gente muy importante que está luchando frente a estos problemas. Y con esto agradezco por darme esta oportunidad. Ashka Parvachu, muchas gracias. So I want to invite all of you who are here today to, to get to know these kinds of proposals and these visions that we have, to get to know the dreams, uh, the knowledge, uh, the, the, the traditions of indigenous peoples, and to, to come closer to actually experience our reality and understand our reality and, and what our solutions and proposals are. We think it, it's absolutely necessary to, to join together in strength, to be in solidarity from local activists to academics, the, the people who really want to truly protect the environment. We know that we have to join forces. And so I want to thank you all for being here today and giving me this opportunity to share with you. Gracias.
quick switch over of interpreter just so we aren't burned out. Para mí es cambio climático cuando entró en la Amazonía, petrolera, mina, colonización, reducción. Eso es para mí cambio de climático. Ellos vienen a dañar a nuestro territorio. Eso conforma a nuestro territorio cambiar. My name is Demortin Kimo. I'm a Guarani woman. And for me, and for our Guarani people, Climate change never existed before. We lived for thousands of years in the Amazon rainforest. We lived within our forest. Our water was clean, our air was clean, and it was only until people came from the outside, oil companies, miners, loggers, people who invaded our lands, that they began to change our territory, deforest our territory, and cause climate change. ¿Por qué yo digo eso? Yo soy una mujer guaurani, joven. Mi territorio guaurani. Es grande, tres provincias, Pastaza, Napo, Orellana. Donde yo vivo ahora en Pastaza no existe petrolera, no existe otros invasores, no existe nada. Donde otras partes, donde mi familiar, donde nació mi abuelo en Yasunín, está petrolera ahí, está operando petrolera, está contaminando agua, está contaminando a los animales, a los humanos está matando ahí, hay el cambio, eso yo he sentido. The Guarani people, we have a large territory. Our territory is three provinces, Napo, Orellana, and Pastaza. And I am from the Pastaza province. It's a roadless area, primary forest where my ancestors live. There's no oil, there's no deforestation. We live well, we live healthily. Our rivers are clean, we have abundant game. But where my ancestors were born, in another part of our territory, the oil companies have arrived. The oil companies have poisoned our rivers, they've killed the animals, and our people are suffering dependency on the companies. And so we're fighting in Pastaza to protect our lands from outside invasion. Por esa razón, nosotros hemos conformado una organización que se llama Fundación Alianza Seibo, como cuatro nacionalidades, Guaurani, Sequoia, Siona, Eh, hemos visto un experimento entre cambio de cultura porque nuestros compañeros que viven en norte viven terriblemente, viven contaminado, no tienen como nosotros bosque muy grande, muy pequeña y hemos unido para luchar porque eso unión se hace la fuerza y me hace sentir más fuerte como mujer. Guaurani, joven, hoy en día estoy luchando cada día. ¿Por qué digo eso? Porque nuestro territorio en Pastaza, el gobierno ecuatoriano ya quiere visitar, ya quiere comprar otra empresa. Y estamos unidos, unión hace la fuerza. Y queremos seguir luchando este bloque 22. Y venido ahí, aquí a explicar sobre qué está pasando en mi realidad actual donde yo vivo en Pastaza. In the Western Amazon we're all facing the same threats and that's why seeing that the oil companies continue to expand into our lands we formed an alliance. As a young Warani woman I helped join forces with the Sionas, the Sequoias and the Kofan people who are living in the northern part of Ecuador who have 50 years of experience living downriver from the oil companies and we formed an alliance where we can interchange cultures, we can learn about the threats that we face, and we can try to create solutions together. The Sionas, the Sequoias, and the Kofanes have lost a lot of territory. They've lost a lot of their health and their culture. And now we join together to form what's called the Sabo Alliance. And the Sabo Alliance has helped us as well defend our lands in Pastaza, the 
government is trying to auction off indigenous territory across the South Central Amazon, and in our territory, they call our lands Block 22, and they want to sell it to the oil companies. And in the Sable Alliance, we've helped to organize the resistance of Warani communities who are still living in harmony with the environment. Eso ha ayudado muchísimo por formar con cuatro nacionalidades, iniciando nuestros propios abuelos jóvenes como mujeres a hacer el mapa, dibujar. Esa herramienta ha ayudado muchísimo a entender por qué el gobierno solo ve que el bosque existe y no siente que el vivo humano y los seres eh, animales, otras cosas para la gente de, de afuera que quieren aprovechar nuestro recurso, lo que gente que piensa el dinero solo ven así un espacio vacío, pero como mujer guaraní existe mucha vida para mí, no solo humano, para los animales, para mis hijos, cuando el futuro no defendemos nuestro territorio como gobierno piensa, el dinero no va a servir para mí, como mujer guaraní, el pueblo guaraní no sirve el dinero. Más importante que va a servir es la tierra, es bosque, río. Eso va a servir para mujer guaraní, para el futuro de los niños guaraní. Eso es mi preocupación muy fuerte. And how are we resisting the oil companies? How are we resisting the government's plans and the government's designs over our land? One thing that we've done as women and as youth of the Warani is we decided to create a map. We created the territorial map of our lands that tries to show the world what our forest means to us, how we live in our territory. There's a fight against the different visions, a fight of different stories. The government, the oil companies, the outside world sees our forest as just resources, as an empty place, and our communities are just dots on that place. But what we have is life in our forest animals, rivers, trails, and we've created a map that we're using to show the world that our territory is not empty, it's full of spirits, and it must be protected. Ahora estamos organizando mujeres como jóvenes, abuelas, y con otras nacionalidades como mujeres mismo, tejiendo nuestra artesanía, cantando nuestro canto, eso es nuestra fuerza que nos da para, para luchar es como estamos construyendo reunidos porque sabemos que ya hemos experimentado con otros compañeros indígenas que han vivido con petrolero y con mi familia que vive en Yasuní y nosotros que como mujer de pastaza no voy a permitir que entren, que destruyen nuestra selva. Eso es muy importante. Yo, ¿por qué estoy aquí? Yo y tú vamos a unir para la lucha del bloque 22, eso nos va a ayudar bastante. Y para el futuro, si yo hoy en día vendo al petróleo, vendo al gobierno, los futuros guaraní van a tener consecuencias. Mi experiencia ahora que fue de nuestros compañeros de California que viven aquí indígenas, ellos también van a sufrir porque eso me impacta mucho todo lo que traen del petróleo de la Amazonía y vienen a, a preparar acá, ellos también son contaminados, no solamente los amazónicos somos afectados, los hermanos de aquí son afectados, eso me ha hecho sentir muy dolor y a la vez estoy demasiado fuerte como mujer joven ahora para seguir luchando para que no debilitemos, soy mujer joven que ha formado recién esa lucha que voy como cuatro años resistiendo porque es muy difícil en mi nacionalidad porque ya vive en una parte que no es un líder que están representados están como quieren como dinero ellos piensan que es dinero importante como mujer como madre para mí no es importante el dinero importante es la vida de la selva importante es la agua también sin agua Sin limpio de agua no existe la vida para la mujer laboral. Our women are organizing in our territory. Our women are recovering their culture, their songs. They're trying to find alternative ways of gaining income to protect their forest. Um, I've traveled up here because I want to join forces with you. I want you to understand that our territory is not for sale. 
the Wurundjeri territory needs to be protected. I went to visit communities here in Richmond and we saw the refinery where the oil from the Amazon is refined and how it is contaminating local communities here in Richmond. We know that if we let our lands be exploited, that oil will come and also contaminate the people here. And so I'm gonna go back and send that message to my people as well that our fight is much bigger. Uh, she said earlier as well that as a mother, as a Warani woman, what I'm seeing is our people cannot depend on money. Our people must protect our land and always live off of the forests and off of the rivers. If we begin to only think about money, then we're going to lose everything. And so I've come up here to share my story with the world and the fight against climate change. que unamos esa lucha del bloque 22, eso me, me da para, no solo para Guaurani, sino para todo el mundo del planeta, porque esa parte en la Amazonía es viva, es aire puro, eso va a ser no solamente nacionalidad de Guaurani, para todo el mundo que estamos presentes, y tenemos que unir esa lucha. I want to ask you all to join us in our fight to stop Block 22, stop the invasion of the oil companies, because our territory is a territory and a rainforest that the whole world depends on for air, for water, and for our climate. Thank you.